Jonathan Moulton, Peter Goldbrook, and everybody at 192 Books and the uh, Paul Cooper Gallery. Um, so I'll do a brief intro before I pass it over to Philo. Uh, Kate Cambrino is the author of many books, most recently of The Light Room, as well as Tone, a collaborative study with Sophia S Samatar. Heroines recently reissued by Semiotex, the fourth book. Coming is Animal Stories from Transit Books. And then Reno is at work on a book of fiction entitled Foam. And she's going to be speaking with Philo <laughs> Cohen, who is an artist, curator, archivist, and a publisher based in Brooklyn. She graduated from Sarah Lawrence College with a BA in Art History and Comparative Literature. Over the years, Cohen has worked as a curatorial assistant and archivist in various institutions in New York, Tokyo, and Paris. She has over 10 years of experience assisting artists in the development of their work, organization of their archive, and communication with public and private collections. In 2024, Cohen will be curating the first solo exhibition of French artist and filmmaker Eleanor, Safe Travel at Justine Sterling Studio, as well as editing a box set of curated entries from this long century's archive, amongst other projects. Uh, we'll be doing a talk and then a Q&A. Then we have uh, the new book, Heroines. Um, almost all of Kate's older books um, available um, at the front desk. Thanks, everyone. Thank um, you. OK. Wait. Am I so Sean? Yeah, are we both? I don't feel like I am. Wait. Yeah, you are. Lift it up. OK. <laughs> Hello. Wait, I still don't feel, I don't feel it. Maybe a little higher up. Feel like you're always still helping me out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do this. Wait, okay. how is that? Yeah, good, I think. Better. I like doing this. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't. Oops. Hi, everyone. It's okay. so nice to see you. And thank you for um, 192 Books for having us. And to Philo, I am going to read a little. I haven't read from this book. I want to say I, ha I haven't read from it for 12 years, but I think I read from a little bit of it 10 years ago. So that's what I'm trying to remember. And I don't usually do readings, but um, I started reading it and it was, I was really surprised by it. And I was like, it would be fun to try to read from it. So I'm just going to read a little bit. Um, this is from the opening. Is the, is the sound okay? Okay. She was supposed to fuck a god. <laughs> <laughs> it's like very eerie. <laughs> is it okay? It's a little echoey. The mic is not working. The mic's not working? Should I just be Should you just like... Can you hear me? Do I sound okay? The voice sounds yeah. okay? Okay, great. She was supposed to fuck a god high up on his mountaintop, but she refused. She wouldn't listen to Apollo's reasoning, so he cursed her a life sentence. He said, sure, you can live forever, as many grains of sand in your hand, but that young, lovely body will be gone. You will wrinkle up into nothingness. Who will love you now? Who will listen? Eventually, her body was kept in a jar, and then there was only her voice left only her voice left, and then not really her voice at all. The rhythm of my mad woman's lives, a long scream followed by absolute silence. At the beginning, I think of endings. The mad wives of modernism who died in the asylum, locked away, rendered safe, forgotten, erased, or rewritten. Vivian Elliott, whose alter ego in her writing was Sibylla, the voice in the jar that begins her husband's poem, The Wasteland. Zelda Fitzgerald, the tarnished golden girl of her husband's legend, who burned to death in an asylum fire in Asheville, North Carolina. All that remained to identify her, a single shard slipper. Jane Bowles stroked out, later buried in an unmarked grave in Malaga, Spain, while her husband, Paul, never stopped writing. Sitting at the mouth of my cave, I stringed together fragments on paper, my scraps scattering to the wind if unread. Out of this narrative will emerge a chalk outline. It is the body of a woman. 
these fragments I have shored against my ruins. And when I used to read from this, I would kind of like scream, rant. <laughs> and I, was, I, I can't bring myself to do that. Um, I wake up and read, although Nietzsche says that's foolish. A sort of narcotic reading. I read with my hands down the front of my pants. My mode of reading is masturbatory. Sometimes I feel guilty about my lubed fingers all over library books. Reading Anais Means Diaries and Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer in tandem makes me want to have affairs, despite or maybe because of the intensity of my love for John. How I once idealized the apparently open marriages of modernism, the triangulation of Anais, Henry, and June, the free love of Bloomsbury, the bulls who shared everything except their beds. In London, the temptation of an angel-faced philosophy student. I, too, want to have a sensual awakening outside of marriage, like Emma Bovary or Edna Pontellier in Kate Chopin's The Awakening. Wifedom of possession. I don't want to be possessed. I want to be free. Like Charlotte Bronte, projecting under our heroine, Jane Eyre, her desire for experience, as Virginia Woolf critiques in a room of one's own. Except instead of wanting to travel the world, reading these books, I temporarily want to fuck the world. A literary nymphomania. This is like such a horny book. That's what I realized. <laughs> <laughs> what was what was going on here? Because of the mythical Lothario conjured up in Nim's journals, I've always fantasized about having an affair with Henry Miller, horn dog Henry Miller, who can't keep his hands off me, who will back me over a couch and go at me, who will fuck me so I stay fucked. In Paris during the second leg of the Bull's honeymoon, Jane goes out alone at night crawling the streets, the lesbian bars. Jane Bowles, who loved to slum like Baudelaire, like Vivian Leigh channeling Blanche Dubois. Outside of one club, a homeless-looking man propositions her nightly. Sometime later, she sees the man's picture in the book section of the newspaper, her forgotten man in the back alley, Henry Miller. I began to compulsively read historical romances as research for a novel. By the way, I don't remember this novel at all. When I was in LA. I have no idea what this novel was. Featuring a housewife <laughs> named Emma who inhales historical romances to numb herself. For days and a days, I can't read anything except these romance novels. I prefer Regency romances, costume dramas, like Jane Austen with fucking. Bridgerton, I was reading Bridgerton. I was really, I was a super <laughs> early adopter of Bridgerton. I suddenly become allergic to anything more highbrow. I watch TV on my computer during the day when I'm supposed to be writing. My favorites are teen soap operas. I ghost fan forums, endlessly analyzing character motivation as well as shipping certain characters, short for relationshiping. Everyone's so passionate about the characters they just know are destined to be together. I love that I have to define shipping here. We are invited over into the house of two history professors for Thanksgiving. We can't eat most of the food because of our vegan diet, and I've also been having terrible digestive problems. They have made four types of cranberry dressing. It's the only thing we can eat, and the hosts blink expectantly at us. One has tequila in it. I lick my spoon tremulously and think of Emma licking the bottom of her glass as Charles falls deep within it. There's a young man there, a jazz pianist with soulful eyes. I realize he's their pot dealer. I find myself mildly flirting with him. My stomach cramps up. I am bowed over. He could be my Leon, I muse absentmindedly. Did Tom foist Bertrand Russell on Vivian to give her something to do? Here, I am the wife of. That is how I am introduced by others. Not a writer, a wife. No one seems to care that I am a writer awaiting the publication of a slim, nervous novella. Everyone much more fascinated with John's career. In his dungeon office, John is surrounded by piles of leather-bound volumes, books that look burned in several languages of Babylon. Elliot studying languages while at Lloyd's Bank. I love seeing John fingering a book, reading its leaves, soothsaying it, speaking its secret history. He can lapse into the charming pendant so easily. My professor acts as Wolf calls the patriarchs of higher learning. Vivian sitting in on the Victorian literature classes Tom taught to working class adults. Her expression rapt, worshipful. She sacrificed everything for him, for his eventual genius. I'm realizing you become a wife despite the mutual attempt at an egalitarian partnership once you agree to move for him. You are placed into the feminine role. You play the pawn. 
once you let that tornado take you away into the self-abnegating state of wifedom, which I did from the beginning, now almost a decade ago, quitting my job as an editor of an alt weekly so we could live in London and he could attend a graduate program in the history of the book. I write this book of shadow histories, these histories of books, shadows. I think I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for listening to that. <laughs> I'm really confused with the timeline of this book because I said over a decade ago, so I think I forgot actually when I wrote this. And I think I keep on saying different versions of it's when it 12, is. 12, right? What do you mean? 12 years? <laughs> yeah, it's well, but it's 12 years that it came out but a lot of the narration of this is longer. was much longer ago. But also I feel like you do that in your writing anyways, yes. right? You have these moments. At the beginning of Heroines, you say, I'm in Ohio. This yeah. is my first moment of solitude. And then at the very end of the book, you say, I'm 20. This is my first moment of solitude. And you're retelling your youth. And so it's like yeah. this sort of like... Yeah, there's a lot of layers. Time. I think a lot of all of my works are a huge problem of time, and I'm always layering time because I'm always like catching up with where the notes were or where this was. But I think I think I started writing. I mean, a lot of these narratives I'm talking about from 26 years old to 36 years, 35 years old, and now you're talking now about it years later that's 12 years later <laughs> maybe feel like 10 years later but. and um, that, yeah yeah sorry I'm yeah all good um, how does it feel when you when you look back actually because I mean heroines is a is a scream right when you when you read this first uh, I feel like sometimes you write of literature in heroines saying literature is a certain type of way and it is what you are doing in heroines it's yeah. a scream well it's Sheila ha Sheila Haiti who, who I became friendly with afterwards but she wrote in the London Review of Books like this is this is a review of someone screaming confined to a shed. I was like, is that a bad thing? I don't know if it's a bad thing. But <laughs> I actually find this book a lot more playful than a scream. I think it's incredibly um, coy and very, very self-consciously playing a persona. I mean, there's the later section where I'm playing. So the character is named John, the husband character. And then the other narrator is unnamed. I mean, it's very much like a pastiche of yellow wallpaper. So I'm like very much like playing with these pretty parodic roles. So I do think it is a scream, but it's also like exceptionally horny, which I, I applaud it for. Like yeah. it's very like, like this narrator needed something that this narrator was not getting, <laughs> or was getting through, or was like, yeah, so bored. Do you think so that's why? Is that why you brought in so many bodies into the text? Because it, you were very horny. Yeah, I think so. Like I remember living in Akron, Ohio, and I was teaching like six classes in two states. Like I was like seven classes in two states. It's by far the biggest class load I ever had. I taught like 7 a.m. composition at the University of Akron, like four days a week. And then I drove like three hours. <laughs> You're like, Micaiah's looking at me. Yeah, like three hours to teach like this night MFA class. I was so overworked. And so I was numbing myself out and completely. And then my, my partner had a job, which was like 12 hours a day. I didn't know anyone in Akron, Ohio. And by the end, I didn't know anyone in Akron, Ohio. I was there for a year and I had no ways to meet people. I wasn't part of any like youth or activist culture there. The only writers I knew were at the university and they were like, they did not recognize me as a writer and I didn't feel a sense of kindredness with them. So I was totally alone. And I'm sh I think now if I was totally alone, I would view it like as a retreat. But for them, for, for me, it was like an escape. But also a lot of this, you know, a lot of the research began in Chicago when I was teaching at a community college um, in the suburbs. I was, you know, and I would just order so many library books and I would be reading so many biographies and I think you know like when you're ki a kid and you have I don't know if they had this well you you moved here when you were how old 15 15 so in in Paris did you have this like where you 
I'm probably not a Pizza Hut. I'm trying to think what the French Pizza, <laughs> you have pizza, pizza Hut is. We have Pizza Hut. Where you pizza go hut. and you like can read all the books. Does anyone have any idea what I'm talking about? And then you got a Pizza Hut pan pizza. No? <laughs> like, like tons of books. And I was always like a, a pretty voracious reader, as I'm sure many in this room were as well. And I think that was a period like a regressive, very like maspiratory, almost erotic period of my life where books and that research was a huge com compulsion and so yeah it was like it was a several year period I think that I was lonely I didn't have a community there was a period of time when I was writing heroines where except for John who was my partner and we you know we had a kindredness about being raised like Catholic Midwestern lower middle class in households where we weren't expected to do anything and had no sense of art or literature. But I didn't, you know, I didn't know another living writer for a long time while I was a writer. So I think there was a sense of, I didn't know people published books in the contemporary. <laughs> like I didn't know <laughs> where they published books and That's where so these books were. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember I was just talking about, um, I think I was talking to Nakaya Hussey who's here. We were talking about like Dale Peck and how Dale Peck would do these like hatchet jobs of writers. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? You know, we were talking about writers now that kind of take down other writers and there's like an interesting energy to it, but are they that interesting? And I remember reading a Dale Peck review in Harper's about postmodern literature and like going to the bookstore and like getting every book that he mentioned because I had no way of knowing what books to read and what contemporary yeah. writer. I mean, that's when I read Infinite Just, and I was like, no, no thank you. <laughs> like, I'm not into this. I think my attention span going to take it. And I also was like, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have, I didn't know who Lydia Yuknovich was. I discovered Lydia Yuknovich in this story that she wrote called Loving Dora mm -hmm. that originally then became a novel that John was the editor of the journal in Chicago. So he published her. Right. And she was one of the first writers where I was like, oh, you can write like this. And Loving Dora was also like, from the point of view of Freud's Dora, it was pretty pornographic. It was full of such exuberant energy. Mm -hmm. And I was like 25 when I read that. Mm -mm -mm. And I think that's like the moment heroines kind of started happening. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry. No. It said that kind of juncture between all these pa these writers of the past, right? And then right. those contemporary voices that kind of seem to storm in into your life because then there is all of these discoveries of crisscross of you you read everything. Right. And yeah. now today in your books today, the writers of today are part of your books much more than in Yeah, in this I'm book, really right? I'm really overcompensating now for like, You're like oh my but yeah I remember like so I was in, I was a waitress in Chicago mm -hmm. and in Chicago in the like early aughts I knew lots of musicians, you know, or I knew a lot of visual artists, but I didn't know that many writers. But it's like weird because a lot of those people who were in Chicago, those writers, are in my community now. But like Daniel Dutton, who runs Dorothy, we waited tables at the same place, but we didn't talk to each other about writing. Why like, is that? Because we didn't, we didn't, we were like always someone's girlfriend to someone, you know what I mean? Like we weren't, we didn't have that sense of community with each other. Like she waited tables at the Silver Cloud, which was like this super dumb bar. You know, and I had like a super dumb boyfriend who was not John, <laughs> that he worked at that bar. Amina Kane, I knew through, who's also published at Dorothy, you know, I knew through Chicago. She like, we both taught at the kind of community college art school. Mm -hmm. And like, I, she was, I knew someone who like was close friends with her, who was the barista at the place I was a waitress. Or like Suzanne Scanlon, who's dedicated. So it's like all these writers who I'm now in conversation with, we were all in Chicago at the same time. Well, you were in conversation with them in some way with Frances Farmer is my sister, right? There was Later. this type yeah. of sort of dialogue yes. with them, yes. which you mentioned yes. is, is present. But why do you think heroines had to be of these women of the past? Like, what was your, your 
sort of convening of them about now that you're looking back? I was in Chicago and working in all these colleges. I was teaching this class called Women in Creativity, which was a compulsory class at the community college. I was also teaching, there was all these like women and classes that were compulsory classes. At the, so women in literature, which Amina Kane also taught. So I was teaching these works and in Women in Creativity, I was teaching you know, Yellow Wallpaper and The Bell Jar and The Bluest Eye, Mad Woman in the Attic, like classics, Room of One's Own. And those kind of became the canon or the syllabus for heroines. The experience especially of teaching these texts to mostly young women um, and young queer people who seemed incredibly anxious and depressed mm -hmm. and less sure that they had any sort of role within literature or the canon, which I, I mean, I taught at a community college that was down the road from my house I grew up with in the Northwest suburbs. So it was like this kind of pretty percolating time. And then my partner John was at the Newberry Library, like another rare books library. And I began to go down there and there was this archive I found. I don't think I've ever spoken about this, but there was this archive I found that was uncatalogued. It was like a box. It was a series of boxes of this um, person called Dorothy Dow. And she was only collected by the Newberry Library because she had had a pen pal relationship with the Illinois poet Edgar Lee Masters. So she was like classified as knows Edgar Lee Masters. And it was a series of boxes that were all of her journals typed up throughout history, like throughout her entire life. And she would bound these journals and wrote like these, she had written a few poetry books. She had been published in Poetry Magazine, which is also Chicago, a Chicago modernist magazine um, that T.S. Eliot was involved in and Marion Moore. Um, but there were these like bound prose memoirs and I became fascinated that I was going to catalog it, like volunteer catalog it. So I began to spend almost every day looking at these boxes and taking notes on them. I, I also have no cataloging experience. I don't know even what happened to these boxes, but I spent a lot of time on it. And then I began to be interested in who were the other women writing during this time period. Mm. Um, so that's when I began to read like Jane Bowles's biography. I remember like sitting in a cafe outside the Newberry Library, like reading the big Jane, you know, Millicent Dillon's Jane Bowles biography. And that's when I read the Vivian Elliott biography. And then, um, and then I think also when we had lived in London, I worked at Foyle's bookstore. And there was this publisher in London called Peter Owens. And they um, publish like Annika Van, they do the Jane Bowles reprints. And so then I became really interested, like, oh, there's all of these super innovative, super experimental, incredible writers. You know, there's, you know, others who I don't even mention in heroines that like Dalkey published as well, like Olive Moore's, Apple in the Dark, like mm -hmm. all of these writers. And I'm like, how, how come I've never heard of these writers? To me, it felt like this huge secret, and it became like this period I began to like think about quite a lot. I, when I was in London, because my partner was working on his master's degree, I began to go to the British Library with him, and I was like, okay, I'm going to read every Anna Kavan book. But Anna Kavan has written like 25 books. I mean, and some of them are like, like she co-wrote a book from the point of view of a horse with her analyst. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, there's like so is. many of them. <laughs> but it was like, I was working, it was like the first essay I had ever worked on that mm. I published in Context, which was through Dalkey Archive, which was also Chicago-based. And so for me, this was like me beginning to, to do this deep research mm -hmm. and archival work, and it focused, it focused on that period. Everything began to turn yeah. with that period. I feel like that obsession de defines how you still work, but even in the time span that I've known you, which is like eight, eight years, um, there is 
uh, different forms that it takes, right? And with, with especially with psyche and madness coming into this, I wonder, of course, this group of women came together because once you open this trap, it's probably boundless. Mm -hmm. like there is probably, it's like a sea or an ocean. But the way that you're weaving them, and when I say scream, I, I didn't mean like you're just oh yelling. Yeah. It's yeah. more a choir of them, like you're convening them up to the surface and there is this really beautiful motion where you're kind of orchestrating their different voices through through you. I wonder about today when you write, you know, especially your recent book with Sophia on tone, how has that relationship to the voices of writers in your writing shifted and you know Oh that's such a good question. Um, you know, I've been, Sophia and I are now doing a lot of conversations with each other about the institutional work, organizing we've been doing, like an attempt at anti-racist and liberatory organizing within institutions that are the opposite of that. It's like a lot of my work I'm doing now is like writing collective letters, like from places of education towards super oppressive and patriarchal boards or admin. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me because I think one of the things that really was part of heroines that I still think is so much part of my work is I was trying to find a, a community for these women and queer gender fluid um, writers and artists who didn't seem to know each other or like each other at all. Like there was a real sense of scarcity among these writers. Like Virginia Woolf was in the same circle as Vivian Elliott and despised her. Like her journals are hilarious, but they're awful, right? Like, you know, Woolf is amazing at a um, insult. Um, I think, what did she call Vivian? Like this bag of ferrets that Tom wears <laughs> around his neck. You know, like she was pretty brutal. And I think there was a sense of recognizing how much violence that was, that they weren't given any a sense outside of like the privacy of these heterosexual couplings that were in, in themselves silencing and oppressive, mm, mm, mm. that they weren't actually allowed to be in community with each other. And of course, because of the incredibly oppressive um, ideas about illness and how they're related to femininity and misogyny and, and laws, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these women's, women were institutionalized that I'm writing about. Um, but it's interesting, like in terms of thinking about my and Sophia's work, I think that heroines was about recognizing patriarchal rhetoric and the violence of it. Like how these women were named as monsters and mad women and so inconvenient and such a you know, a uh, horrible, unfortunate asterisk in the lives of the great men. And I realize, like, thinking about, you know, institutional critique and, you know, I'm dealing a lot right now with organizing for teachers at my kids' school, and I can't tell you how many times in the past week I've been called aggressive or divisive, like, for actually trying to, um, think of what is anti-oppressive work. But this is also, I think, a lot of the energy behind no pressure, uh, behind heroines. Who gets to name? Who gets to decide that someone is being irrational or being monstrous or being, because they're angry, they are somehow mm -hmm. um, ill? Because they're ill, they're somehow not human? You know, like that whole, that whole, um, binary, mm -hmm. I think, which was so obvious in this time, I think it's still, I still, I think it's still like this real rhetorical move of, right. of patriarchy, of, of like the psychosis of corporations, right. of, of who gets to name who has power, who has power gets to name. Which, I mean, you know, it's been over a decade and then 
so much more time since these women lived, but it feels so very sadly and tragically current. Also, these narratives of, um, you know, you talk about modernism as myth making, but I feel like our current times is we're witnessing it, how the history is weaving itself as this myth making of. Um, white supremacy and oppression and colonialism and I, I, f I, I feel like in your writing these convenings allow for this sort of like you know maybe it's, it's liberating to, to, to read your words because there is this sort of uh, it's, a, it's a group in, yeah. in your voice so um, so yeah and on that note I'm thinking again about Frances Farmer is my sister. Yeah. And I want to ask you about that in relationship to today because that whole moment of, you know, blogging and writing on the internet and you, you talk about what the internet it's does for you. Name, isn't it? Frances Farmer is my sister. I, was I love like it. Really audacious. I was like, that's the name. I and I I stuck with and me. And then and then blog. wrote me like <laughs> 15 years ago. She's like, do you know I did a film about Frances Farmer? Really? I, did yeah. I didn't know. I had no idea. Well, now, yeah. All these collective affinities mm -hmm. that I wasn't aware of. It's like, why are we all, right. so, so why are so many of us obsessed with the same people? Right. I mean, how does it work today for you? Because, so the blog stopped and you said that internet helped fight your own erasure. Yeah. I wonder how, I mean, you emailed today. I feel like you're a boss email. Like you're really, you're I'm, like, I'm you're communicating through email. My email skills are starting to break down. <laughs> like my ability to have any relationships over email. But that's private in the private, yeah. right? So what's what's today? You know, the internet. You don't have social media. You don't have. What oh, I mean, I guess, I guess, writing books. Like I feel a that's little true. bit like, like, especially thinking about just the events for me of the past couple of years or thinking about crisis or thinking about, you know, political depression. I'm, I sometimes feel like my books are where I put like all my feelings about it because otherwise I have no place to communicate to them, you know? So I think, mm -hmm. I think to me, I began to channel this into notebooks, but now, yeah, usually into books. The books are like one big feeling they're all very defined by a feeling. And it's usually a feeling like, this is where I can put what I'm thinking and feeling and I don't actually talk to other people about it. And you feel like in heroines, you weren't putting as much no, I think of it's, your, yeah. because for example, the parentheses yeah. have a lot of your feelings. At first, yeah. I feel like you're writing. Oh, I definitely and then think you heroines the is like the big, is the like big the feelings. the Japanese publisher of heroines, yeah. they, they called their press was like a Japanese, amazing Japanese translator who like started the press just to translate heroines. And they named, she named the press crying in public. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, that's great. That makes sense. Like I like books where there's crying in public. Yeah. I like to read books about crying in public. And yeah, I still, I think heroines is definitely crying in public. I mean, that's, that's what I'm doing, crying and ranting. Like, there's lots of big feelings in it. Yeah, I, f I feel like you're... I keep on thinking about that last moment where you speak about your younger self, which I I don't know why I, I hadn't remembered that from the first time I read it, be maybe because I was my younger self myself, so it felt more like equal time. But when you talk about that crisis moment, when you were younger, it. do you do you remember that? <laughs> I don't see. remember writing most things in this book, to be totally honest with you. Except I think the thing about the silver heels at the end, I'm never gonna live down. When you say like, that you're a fucking genius in the mirror, someone wrote me today. They're like, "You're a fucking genius." And I'm like, "Oh," but I also really appreciate that. <laughs> I want people to tell themselves that. But. I don't remember. Yeah, you write. Oh, in my 20s. Yeah, in yeah. your 20s. And I. Yeah. It's like one of the first. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's the first time that I feel like I see you write so face to face in the mirror with your younger self. And yeah. that, that was powerful for me, who's read your literature for so many years. And I, I wonder now, today, when you look back at heroines, do you feel like you're looking at yourself? 
or do you feel like it's your younger self still? Like, I'm really interested in that act of transmission. Oh, yeah. In your novels and then your prose, and you know. Well, I don't have any erotic feelings towards Henry Miller like anymore. Zero. There's like zero part in my body that would like would imagine ever writing Henry Miller. Um, apparently, I felt Jane Bowles, maybe Henry Miller, no, but um, uh, yeah, um, it is definitely a former self. But I do, it's nice, for so long, I felt a little ashamed of the book. Mm. It got so much attention, some of it positive, some of it negative, that I was like, this is bad. Like, I'm bad. I'm going to go hide. You know, like, I've published this book. This is bad. Um, and kind of, I hid from it for a while, which is why I didn't read from it. I didn't read it. Um, I feel this way for Book of Mutter as well, um, that they are these pretty powerful books in all of their flawed now there's such an energy and force to them I kind of wrote these books pretty confident that no one was ever going to read them and so they have this real intensity and force to them um, yeah. they do feel like former selves but I do think part of my me being a writer and a person is that I'm realizing that I, I'm still kind of re repeating myself. Like, I'm still writing about those selves. I'm not writing about, you know, this period as much, but I'm currently in the works I'm writing now. I'm going back to the period just before I met John. I, I've had a period of, like, ex-boyfriend suicides during the pandemic, like, several. <laughs> Um, which says a lot about where I'm from um, to me and is making me confront for the first time since Book of Mutter, which I think is the only time I've ever written about where I'm from. Um, I'm not from anywhere bad, but I'm from a place where it's not really surprising to have like several ex-boyfriends commit suicide. Um, so right now I'm returning to the same period in the same place and it surprises me and it really terrifies me in many ways. I think that there are some people who are very integrated with their past. Like they remember everything about their childhood. They have a very healthy relationship with it. They've gone to lots of therapy. Um, but for me, like, I often don't write about adolescence or mm -hmm. childhood because um, it's kind of like it feels so much like I had to reinvent myself as a completely different person to become a writer like if you're from a place where no one expects you to do anything and you become a writer then you leave and don't talk to anyone I mean that's like my thing which is probably not super healthy but um, so I'm actually going back to um, being younger, which I know is more of the traditional thing to do in memoir, which but which I have assiduously af avoided for most of my books. That's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, before we open it up to questions, because I know you must have questions, I just want to, on that, on you saying that, and us, what we were, just full circle, what we were saying at the very beginning of the unstructured, kind of broken time. I feel like, I mean, you've always told me about how a, a book or writing in general is like a room, right? And, and, and now that there are all of these books and this reissue and, you know, it's like you have the house of you and I, I can't help but think that you're just within that house still... <laughs> Go <laughs> um, going back and opening new doors and, you know, I just, I'm curious about what you're writing now and how, how that's doing that, if anything, but you said that a bit. I'm mostly writing collective letters now. Like for the past week, I've been like organizing in a crisis situation where all I'm doing is writing we mm -hmm. in like very forceful rhetorical mm -hmm. statements. You know, it's interesting and I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I present this without judgment. But I kind of think of everything I've ever written as having nothing to do with me. 
Like for me, I completely started a new house. I don't remember any of the it's books. Not, it's not the same house. Yeah. No, it's not the same house. That's, that's why I want to ask. Like, you. there's like a distance, a distant memory relationship with the previous books, because I feel like I'm trying to work on writing. I've been calling it the apartment series, like apartment and also apart, like isolation. I'm trying to write a, in a different way about crisis, and I. And also somehow about, um, I don't know, an institutional life within higher education um, and, and landlords. So I'm trying to write a lot <laughs> about, I guess, still about oppression in some ways. But I'm, I'm having to completely, for me, I don't ever feel like I've figured out how to write. I mean, I think there are probably some writers who have, but like every story or small piece or book I write, I'm like, I have no idea how to write anything. Like I have no, I've never written anything before. You know, what is this? <laughs> like, how do you write a book? And that's how I approach everything. So I don't feel like I have like a professional ease with writing. And I always feel like I'm reinventing it and have no idea what I'm doing, and I'm failing miserably until it's like, okay, you know? Yeah, I know. I mean, that's, I, that's I, writing, I yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. writing, it's all of us. Yeah. Should we, does anybody, should, how do we do with the mics? Speak very loudly. Okay. <laughs> I'll turn this off. Should I turn off, no, I should keep my mic on. Does anyone have any questions? Heroines? Yeah. So it's so interesting you asked that because I feel like that was so erased, including by me. Um, until recently, I was asked to give a talk on Claude Cahoon at the New Museum for the Judy Chicago show, which a show I had, a, I, I had some issues with, especially how kind of the canon of past artists were used. Um, I was also like, I was like, does Claude Cahoon want to be considered part of the City of Ladies? But I was like, I named this after Claude Cahoon. And it was Claude Cahoon's book, Heroines, which is a series of fictional, very parodic monologues about like Joan of Arc or Cleopatra. And they're very, you know, arch. They're very parodic. You know, they're, you know, they're first person, but they're all these personas. I mean, that was the original inspiration. But at the end of the book, I have this line where I'm like, after all, we must be our own heroines. And then that, I was, that was it. But the, the idea of heroines was always a bit arch. It was always a bit, I don't know, there was a little bit of like a italicized around it. Like, who performs this? Right? Who, who are these heroines personas? And how have these artists been made to play these archetypes throughout history? But yeah, it was Claude Cahoon. It was nice for me to revisit Claude Cahoon, the um, amazing photographer and gender fluid performance artist. Because it also reminded me, you know, there were so many reviews of heroines that presented it as so heterosexual, which I think is accurate but I think I was seeing the problem of heterosexuality I think I was satirizing this marriage um, with full consent of my partner which is which gives that some dimension but I think it's also pretty queer I'm writing a lot about queer and gender fluid artists and the the person I present in there I think I have this line about like my Joan of Arc at jacket and my butch demeanor is pretty also very gender fluid so it was nice to remember that as opposed to the way I think it's now read is like this like I don't know like very heterosexual book I think it's problematizing that more than anything but yeah it's Claude Cahoon heroines which is yeah we were talking about finding these archives, like were you 
and reading all these books and were you writing at the same time or just like taking notes or like how did you do with all your classes and everything? I had this oh because I was teaching so much yeah, yeah. It's quite in Chicago I was like teaching so much because like we would make very little per class but it was also I taught the same class it's weird it wasn't as much stress as it is teaching in New York it's like very different it's a very different mode of teaching um, but I also bought so many books for heroines which I'm like pretty like I bought so many used books I was like oh I need to own this very random modernist biography so I also like there was this point in North Carolina um, where I, I remember I would be sitting at the table, this like big table, and I would have like a hundred books on the table. Like I went through this period where I was like, well, I have to read like a million books to write this. I don't know why <laughs> I thought that. But yeah, I was really, I was like doing a dissertation for a PhD program that wouldn't have me, you know? <laughs> like I was just like, this is, has to be my life's work and I have to read everything. So I don't know, I think it's nice to remember that Especially since, don't worry about it. Um, especially since, to me, reading is harder now. It's less pleasurable. Like some, don't you know? Like sometimes you find a book, it's so pleasurable. You're so happy to be able to exist in it. Other times it can be, but you know, a little more. It's hard to be so porous. And that was a period where it was like very all I wanted to do was read about these lies. I mostly took notes, but the thing is with me about, and I would have like all these legal pads, and it drives my partner John crazy because he's an archivist and we're a books library and I threw out most of it. Like I wrote everything longhand. I like, we, we live in a tiny place, we move a lot. But like, I mostly couldn't read any of my handwriting, so the notes were totally illegible and not usable, so it was not like a great system. But it was, this project, and my earlier work identified so much with outsider artists, like artists like Azelda Fitzgerald or like Henry Darger and Book of Mutter, who were compulsive but were never recognized. So I think that was a lot of my process. <laughs> I think that was a lot of my process. Like the, the note taking was deeply pleasurable. And to this day, I still note take a lot and I can't read my handwriting. <laughs> and it's become really like very absurd or I completely lose where my notes are. Um, okay, yeah. So you, you weren't actually like, you were mostly like reading for a long time and like writing. Yeah, after, I would like long this. hand write notes, like quoting everything mm. that I didn't need to. Mm. And it was, yeah, it was a pretty, and I think also I was very scared of Criss Cross, like mm. scared like, she would hate my book. I did write a draft. I wrote a draft of the book. In longhand? No, I wrote an actual like computer draft of the book. And I was I flew to LA to see Criss Cross. It's the only time like we worked on the book together. And she was like, Okay, I want you to take this book. <laughs> Maybe important. <laughs> Maybe important. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't worry about it. She's like, okay, take this draft and like, just like th throw it out. <laughs> like it's garbage. Oh, <laughs> like, like just completely throw it out. Like, I want you to take this book and I want you to completely rewrite it because this is not it. So I did. So then I think, I think you know, I just kept on rewriting it. So I think at that point, like all the reading and all the note taking was like, I have to. She was my really my only reader to me. Mm. Like I had to bake her happy. Um, yeah, yeah. Just throughout the, I had I had lots of drafts I got thrown out. Was she your teacher or was it an informal relationship? It was so. <laughs> the the writer Matthias Wigner, who's Kathy Acker's executor, he he once said to me something like like every writer, artist, thinker has a maker, like in vampire mythology. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like who's the one who's your maker? Um, you know, like who makes you a vampire? <laughs> um, and I think for me, like Chris Cross and Lydia Yukovich were my makers. With me not knowing anyone, they were the two who kind of recognized me from afar in some way. I submitted 
my first two novels to the Lydia Yuknovich's very tiny press, the contest she had there. And for Chris, I mean, it's a longer story that I don't, but for Chris, I just contacted her. And I asked her to blurb O Fallen Angel, which was the tiny book that was coming out through Lydia Yuknovich. And then I asked her to publish Green Girl. She's like, I will not publish Green Girl. <laughs> like, no. Um, but then we kind of, she then started reading the blog. And her and Haiti Old Colty started reading my blog, which like the pornographic fantasies about Henry Miller, which is again really hilarious to me how bad my taste was. I think I was joking. I think I, I really think I was joking. But um, all those like long, glittering, very, I guess, agitated and funny blog posts, they read and they contacted me. And they were like, how would you like to write a book for semiotext? And I was like, what's semiotext? Because I was not, you know, my partner knew what it was, but I, I didn't, I had known her work, and I knew Kathy Acker's work well, but I didn't really know Semiotex well. But yeah, they paid me $1,000. It was so, I was like, oh my God, I'm getting paid to write a book. It was a very big deal. And then it took me a long time to write it, because I was like, it has to be good, and I don't know how to write a book for a Semiotex, but that it's here. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. published, it's and now it's out again. Are there any other questions? Are we done? Yeah. Okay. Why, did they, why did you reissue it? What was the it just ran out of print. Okay. Like, and I think they didn't want to do any more printings. And I think that um, he wanted to reissue. Semutex is really great at um, keeping their books in print. Like they're really, and that's rare. Like they're really wonderful at that. And I think there is this general sense that when the book came out, it got a lot of attention, but it was a very different climate. Like this is before Me Too. This is before a lot of group biographies that came out about women. You know, there have been a lot that have come out since then. And I think AD and Chris kind of thought, well, what if this came out again? Because we were talking to people who like knew my other work and had never heard of heroines. And so, I mean, I was glad for it. I was like, yeah, okay, this, this makes sense for this to come out again. Because it really is, it's audience, it's, you know, this idea, like, what would it be like for a, a different generation to read it? And I think we were surprised that the book still has so much affection towards it. It was like a surprise, and it's really nice. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, which one of uh, Chris's pieces sort of made you feel like she was your maker? So, well, it's more that she made me write a book okay. <laughs> that I was very oh, unwilling. Okay, got it. What's funny, okay, so my real maker, I'm going to say this quickly, my real maker is the queer theorist Laura Berlant, who I studied with in grad school and kind of did not think I was very smart, but I think they did see something in me, but something very new and unpolished. And I applied to the MFA program at Columbia when I was like 23, 24, and I decided not to go. I didn't have any money, so I didn't even apply. But Lauren Berlant had written me a letter and sent it to me and did the signature over the envelope. Did I tell you this story? Yeah. So I opened it, and the letter said, Kate has given you her serious self, soulful in the 90s feminism sort of way. But like maybe someday she could write books like Kathy Acker and Criss Cross. And I was like, who the fuck is Criss Cross? <laughs> I, had <no> idea. <laughs> I had no idea. And I remember getting Aliens and Anorexia, like the, you know, those cool little native agents copies from the library and my brain couldn't handle it. Um, <laughs> and then <laughs> what I knew about her and I like began to be a little more aware of native agents and semiotext, but I didn't read I Love Dick 